Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Plastic Club's second Zoom salon. And this one is for the exhibit that's called The Blues. <laughs> okay. My, my exhibit was inspired by um, another artist here that will be speaking with a very better pre presentation. So before I begin, I want to thank all of those who made this online exhibit and salon happen. That's Bob Lee, Tina Chung, Laura Stork. What would we do without our backup? Um, they're not really the backup. I, I look at me as more the backup. So I want to remind you about the next exhibit before we begin, and that is be inspired by someone you consider a great artist. And this person can be someone recognized by art books, but we know how they are. They select people they like, and they may not be actually great. So it could be someone whose work you per personally consider to be great. And your work can be inspired in whole or in part by these other people. The prospectus is online. And I would say is my introductory mask was inspired by David Horowitz, who will speak later about his self-portrait. So that's what I say is that your inspiration can be anyone that all of a sudden inspires you to do, you think is great because it gives you a great idea. And I apologize to David about the bag. <laughs> so I want to remind people that um, those who participated in this event were eligible for a lottery. And we have three winners who were picked at random and each get four free workshops. And the winners are Rose Cheney. Yay. Bonnie McAllister. Yay. And Fred Kogan. Yay. So you can use these yourselves or they can be gift certificates. So anyway, thank you for participating and congratulations. Um, so I also want to remind you now, and we'll talk again later, to look at our, the webpage for the Plastic Club. There is so much happening. I mean, it just even this, this morning, more things came on. There's going to be another salon next Sunday that is um, going to be about making things basically from your dining room or kitchen table. And it's at the same time, one to three. It's use the mundane to create the extraordinary. So please take a look at the webpage and sign up for this extraordinary Zoom. Um, Bob Moore later on will talk about his Tuesday share exhibits. And there's just more and more. Just keep looking at that website. All right, let's get started. So the first one, um, Gwen Harper. Her image, August Meltdown. There we go, Roberta, can you see that? Okay. okay, so I looked up at the weather in Philadelphia. It's been hot, 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 hot up until today. Of course, today is raining, I think, isn't it? And it's cool. But obviously, this hot weather has gotten to Gwen. And when I saw this, I said, oh my goodness, it looked like Munk, the scream. <laughs> she couldn't stand this heat. And she did this great piece of work. You can see these bands of verticals that just seem to be virtually melting in there. And even the sun started melting from that normal um, symbol of it, the circle, into this um, sort of a parallelogram, but not exactly. So I thought that was just a great way of starting um, from Philadelphia. So thank you, Gwen. Um, two is Emily, she. And when I contacted Emily, who's not going to be with us, and you'll hear why, I got this surprise answer. Emily said, oh, it was so nice to hear and for me to discuss her work, but if she's sleeping now, she lives in Taiwan. <laughs> and they're 12 hours different from what we are. And she says, hello. And I just thought that was so cool that we have now reached out internationally and nationally to people um, all across the ocean. And that's what she was depicting, an ocean and this wonderful sunrise. If you look at what she has, she has great values in her ocean, um, different kinds of blues, different shapes of blues. She has stratas, but they're very interesting because they're not just lines. And then she has those lovely complementary colors in her sunset, those yellows, oranges, and pinks. So hello, Emily, 12 hours from now. Okay, number three, 
we have Ron Plogue, who is here. <laughs> His um, piece is Tangled Up in Blue. And we have another, we have, we're gonna have two photos from Ron. And one of the things um, I liked about Ron's piece and the extra photo is it's about a theme that we can see a lot. The outside world is changed and made even more beautiful by the artist. And we'll see this a number of times from these different artists, trash cans and um, backyards. I mean, it just got to be more beautiful. And what I looked at when I saw this was this beautiful light surrounding these dark areas, focusing on the subject. And I said, so what is this? Is it flowers? Is it ice? It just intrigued me. And now I'm going to let Ron talk to this piece. <laughs> Ron? And Tina, can we get the other piece up also? Yeah, here's the original. Here's the original that Ron used, so she, yeah, she'll go some, back and forth. Yeah, some sort of a uh, <clears throat> plant that grows by the sea in Greece, and um, that's such an intriguing shape. Uh, it's probably upside down, but that's how I saw it uh, there, and it just seemed like, uh, you know, it spoke to me, and um, and then so I changed, uh, you know, uh, some filters. I don't remember exactly what I did because some of it is, um, um, you know, ex experimentation, uh, but uh, uh, included the blue color. You know, there's a black and white filter then added some blue uh, color and then uh, thought that the center called for more light. So if you look back at the, at the final version, you can see that. Tina, could we have that up again? Yeah. Back Sorry, is uh, the back one? Yeah. yeah, the original, the, his oh. mission. Yeah. yeah, so just, Beautiful. you know, adding, adding this light coming from the center seemed to me to suggest that this is some sort of a life form that's about to um, emerge. <laughs> yeah. So, and just the shapes, you know, it's the, the shapes, the color, it's, it's, uh, and, that, and that light. I mean, it seems like with lots of shape, there's lots of diagonals and those little prickly little edges and stuff. It just seems like, okay, I'm going to grab you. <laughs> And I mean, this is so much more beautiful than the original photograph. This is just quite intriguing, quite lovely and puzzling. I mean, it's nice that, you know, I keep looking at it, even though you said what it is and I just keep thinking about it. So thank you very much. It's a wonderful submission. Thanks. Um, number four is Cynthia Harvey, Waterway. So I don't know, Cynthia, are you here? So I'm just, because she's not here, I'm just gonna briefly say, I mean, I love the blue. As soon as you see this blue, wow, great. And the other thing that's so amazing about this piece is that with very little, she's able to suggest the outside world. If you look at the left um, bottom quadrant, you have a, um, a perpendicular line and that suggests the boat. You see the little white sail? So that just barely suggests the boat going through the channel. If you look upwards from there, there's this green area. So she's suggesting like trees and whatever. You go up further, that horizontal line across the blue, there's the land. And across this cruciform, she has this very strong composition of a cruciform. You see this red against the blue. So what is that? Is that the sunset coming in on the ocean? Is that the sun against the um, white buildings? It's lovely because it makes you think about it. And I loved how she was able to use so little to suggest so much. So thank you, Cynthia. Okay, um, number five is Mike Ricerto, Cerrito. Did I get it right, Mike? Mick. Ricciretto. Yeah, <laughs> Ricciretto, okay. Blue dumpsters. So. Um, remember what I said is that art can make ugly things more beautiful? Well, the outside world has changed and certainly made more beautiful by the artist. And pardon my joke, but nothing goes to waste in this um, painting. Anyway, the dumpster may contain trash on the inside, but he captured the beautiful calligraphy and the stickers that formed a very nice horizontal band that kept your eye moving across. He has um, the bands on the sidewalk have that lovely texture, as well as that floating white and beige tan areas that keep it just active and moving. And what I liked is just this contrast of textures, this very solid looking dumpsters broken up by calligraphy, as well as that lovely sidewalk um, curb area. And all of this is on a tiny piece of paper. 
So Nick, can you tell about how you normally work? Where did you get this? Is it part of a series? What size do you normally work on? Just talk about this work in your process. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually work a lot of the time in a small five inch by eight inch sketchbook. So um, I'm used to doing things small, but um, yeah, these sort of small sheets like the watercolor blocks, I like working small. The funny thing is I love to, I love painterliness, but then I, I spend so much time on the details. So I, I just get that I do that. It's just something I do. So when I see things like this, like I know it sounds gross, but all that stuff on the sidewalk is like probably coming out of the dumpsters, right? It's like, gross rain but those you know this it was it was wet out that day so I was trying to get the idea that there's a sheen there and that to me is like painterly and all those like glyphs and graffiti things are painterly and over time like graffiti is wiped out by people putting other paints on walls and it's kind of funny because they end up looking kind of like modern art because you'll get blocks of one color and then blocks of another as you cover up the other scribblings and all that just looks painterly to me. So when I see scenes like this, even though it's a dumpster, even though it's dirt and junk on the curb and stuff, to me, the whole scene, when it when the light is captured well, looks to me like, you know, just sort of some sort of abstract art from life, things which are mundane and banal, but to me just have a real nice, you know, like uh, almost like a handprint to them, like people were here kind of look. It's, it's just a beautiful piece. I don't know if anybody has a question from him. Did you work from a photograph um, with this? Yeah, I took a whole bunch of pictures around the corner. This is actually right around the corner from the plastic club. So I took a whole bunch of pictures of the dumpsters out there and sort of rearranged them in a way that I liked. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that shows that's the artist. The artist changes reality. It would not be as beautiful if you didn't have this off balance um, um, arrangement of these rectangle shapes. I'm sure they were probably more lined up evenly. They're all skewed together, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're the artist and, and reality changes with the artist. Bravo. Nice, Thank nice you. piece. Thanks Love a lot. Um, number six is John Stridsinger. Did I mispronounce the name? Is he here? I did. I had a question for Mick. Yes. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Was that watercolor, Mick? Yeah, watercolor, yeah. So I've never really worked in watercolor. So I have a question. Um, is that like one shot? Or I mean, can you, how does it, I mean, can you, if you make a mistake, do you go over it? Can you go over it with watercolor? How does that work? Like, how long, you know, like how much, how much do you have to get it right the first pass type of thing with watercolor? So and this painting can, in particular. Yeah, you can do it's nice to start out light with a with a, just a little bit of chroma and then you can keep going over it to get what you like. And that's one of the nice things about watercolors. You could put down like a yellow color, mm -hmm. like on the sidewalk, for instance, and then just, you know what, that needs to be a little more red there. That needs to be a little bit more brown. So you can keep adding. But if you don't like something, you probably have a minute or two to maybe like wipe okay. it up or scrub it or something. Uh, Turner used to scrape stuff to put white highlights there and a bunch of other artists. Well, that's interesting. Understand. So yeah, yeah, you can always bring the white back. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah sure. Thank you. Yep. And Jane, Jane has her hand raised. Jane. So I, yes, I wanted to say that I knew this was Rick's work right away because he has shown his work in the Tuesday sharing. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out um, to Rick. I love your distinctive style and your use of white very often. Um, but my shout out also goes to the Tuesday sharing. Um, Bob, Moore, Bob Morris is, we're gonna see his piece and he's gonna speak to that, Jane. Okay, so. But thanks, never heard to repeat. Mm -hmm. cool, cool. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you and the questions were very good. David, you were, did you come in late? I, I will have a surprise for you a little bit later after seven. You're you're in two. John Stritzinger, is is he here? Yes, uh, John Stritzinger. Hi. Hi. Okay. So, big welcome to John. He said that he's heard and knows of the Plastic Club and got on our mailing list through our great ambassador, Rick Wright. <laughs> Rick's awesome. So these things are you all ambassadors former and current people, current, um, and, and 
this mixed media is really good that people see it and then take part in it. So we're glad that you're on our mailing list. And this work was very intriguing. I mean, these shadowy, ghosty figures. I mean, I, um, you know, you gave the title, but I certainly want you to talk about your process because again, this is art being changed, reality being changed by the artist in some ways being improved, not just these skaters sort of going around. It's really very, very um, puzzling, very um, intriguing. And I, you didn't address to me, but if you would talk to me what, and the rest of the people, what is that, those white slanting diagonal lines? Um, you know, I didn't know if it was rain or water or, or you just put those in. So could you address your photography? Sure, yeah, this is, um, I really like doing sl uh, long exposures, which means something, you know, more than just a split second. And so this is taken at City Hall in the middle of winter. Skaters were out and the uh, lines at the top are actually the little light bulbs that are on strings that string <laughs> over the top of there. And so I'm both moving the camera intentionally here, as well as taking uh, an exposure that was probably about a second. So the skaters are moving, getting some, that softness, that sort of, um, you know, foggy, ethereal sort of look. Beautiful. And I uh, worked with this image. Um, I believe I added one of the figures. Uh, so I, I took that from another image and put that into here so that I would have a, a composition that I was looking for. And I did this both as a black and white, and then I've done this as a, uh, as a split tone as well. I, I, for me, I was trying to get the sense of the skaters in motion, you know, the skaters moving and the way that you aren't really quite sure who they are or what they are. Are they skaters? There's maybe the glimpse of an edge of a skate somewhere. And I, I like the um, surprise that you get with something like those lights at the top of the image. Uh, I like the contrast of those uh, straight diagonal lines against all the softness of everything else. Yeah, definitely. It was always a question. What are those lines? <laughs> yeah, and so it's just, it was, it was uh, like many of these kind of uh, photographs, there's a surprise, you know, you can't control the whole process. And then it's afterwards when you're looking at it, that if you kind of got what I was, I was going for this feel, um, then what else I could do with it. So one of the things you had written back, to me yeah. is that you like to have um, cinematic moments. And actually these yeah. fuzzy creatures moving around seem out of, I don't think it's a horror film, but it does seem like they're returning from not normal reality, <laughs> I, but it, it does have a sense of being very cinematic. Um, so I think you do successfully achieve one of your aims. Thanks. So this is lovely. And so we'll see you in the next um, exhibit and uh, future exhibits, I hope. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. I know a number of people who are in the plastic club over the years, and so I've gotten some thought about uh, potentially joining, yes. Great, Isn't hope that? to see you there and, and see you next month. So David Horwitz, um, so my apologies to him. This was my, <laughs> when I was thinking of what should I do blue, I was thinking of David Horwitz's Self-portrait. Now, this is not a self-portrait of me. I do want to say that. <laughs> but um, again, I put in a plug for being inspired by other artists um, to do something. David had inspired me to um, do the bag art. <laughs> David, could you address your piece? One of the things um, about his piece is that it's as far from photorealism as he could be. This is um, definitely doesn't look like David. <laughs> so can oh. you can you describe how you went about um yeah. well I, I actually want to address one more feature when i looked at this i was very drawn to the eyes and the eyeglasses and i had wondered if david was making a philosophical point was his point about the artist has sees reality in ways that other people don't and so he's drawing attention to the eyes that's comparable to somebody like Rodin. If you look at his sculptures, and they're certainly there in Philadelphia, all of his sculptures have these huge hands because he's a sculptor. They're, they're certainly not you know, the size proportionally, but that's, he's making a statement as an artist. So I had been wondering if David was making a statement of the artist, is that the artist is this seer. So David, could you address your photography? Well, I, I wanted to say, you mentioned Gauguin as a sculptor. Go. Rodin, Rodin. Rodin. I Rodin. think it's the Gauguin because interestingly, I thought I misheard you because there's a 
statue at the Met in New York by Gauguin of a six-year-old son. Ah. And it's a beautifully done classical piece of sculpture. And I put up on Facebook, can you guess who the artist is? Huh. And I gave a lot of hints, French, 19th century. He's also a painter. And they went through all the normal, and nobody could guess. And these are people, you know, artists who have you know, extensive, um, you know, um, you know, background in art history. No one, guessed it, no one guessed it was Gauguin because it was so atypical um, in terms of his work, his paintings. It's, it, it's, it's just a beautiful classical sculpture of his son's head, a bust. And when you said Gauguin, I th well, Rodin, I think you said Gauguin, and I was like, oh, someone else is going to talk about Gauguin as a sculptor, which is more unique. Yeah. <laughs> um, this piece, um, you know, it, it's a self-portrait. I, I, you know, I, I, it doesn't really look like me. Um, those weren't glasses. It was just Tina, the way we don't I have his image. Tina, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you. I don't see his image, do I? Oh, can, can you see the screen share? Yeah, we're we're seeing it, Roberta. I see. I oh, okay. Good. <laughs> I thought maybe it popped up. Okay, good. Yeah, I, for me, in terms of you know, everyone comes at these things differently. For me, I'm really turned on by, you know, color and how, what color does for me when I paint and the mood I'm trying to, you know, create. And um, so I concentrate more on that rather than, I guess, trying to get a, you know, an accurate image, let's say. It's just, what is, how can I use color to feel something about what I'm doing, whether it's a self-portrait or a bowl of fruit, you know, or something. And um, so, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pretty messy the way I work. I'm pretty neurotic in most life, in most things in life. But when it comes to painting, it, weirdly, um, I'm not that neurotic in that I don't really care or worry. I, not that I don't care, that's the wrong word. I don't worry about, I don't overthink it is a better way of putting it. I just kind of go at it. And, um, and most of the time when I paint, I get it kind of right the first go around. That's I hate crazy. going back to try and tinker and fix. And maybe that's because I don't really have the training. You know, with maybe better training, I would be able to go in there and fix. But I find whenever I go in and try and fix, I just blow it up um, to something worse. And now I do paint over canvases, maybe 15 or 20 percent. And, um, and that's when I just don't like it. And I'll paint over it. Um, I won't white it out, but I'll, I'll use what's there and, and do something completely new. And... Um, so really when I go at it, I don't really have a preconceived idea of what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. I kind of know what color I want to start with. And I start with blue, for instance, and I'll start with that. And, um, and I'll just kind of go at it and start throwing colors at it. And until it gets to a point where I, you know, I like line too, but it's definitely color I emphasize more until I kind of get to a point where it just works for me and then I stop, and um, and I don't worry about that many mistakes. And uh, you know, I, I really like listening to music. I know this sounds kind of like a little bit like, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to get too um, out there, but when you listen to some musicians, I'm often inspired by them talking about their music. And um, like John Lennon, there's a great video on YouTube of John Lennon um, in this English estate that he lives on, and some spaced out American hippie young guy is camping out on the on the estate and he's like you know disheveled and you know kind of spaced out and he thinks John Lennon's songs are being written for him you know and John well, yeah. Lennon you know <laughs> is from Liverpool and you know I know he was like you know you know he did you know stayed in bed with Yoko Ono for a week and all this stuff like that but he has a sort of like a Liverpool edge to him you know Paul McCartney does too and uh so he's trying to talk the kid down saying like how could I write this song for you you know it's like he he's actually says it's like if it's a love song it might be about yoko and were you listening to music while you were no i don't i don't i find it distracting this is but the, the kid keeps inspiration the, the kid keeps trying to like make this connection to lennon like you know was okay. this about me or well and then he says well if not me then everyone else and john lennon basically says a few things like it's, it's such a kick out of no he says it's like whether i had a good shit that morning you know mm -hmm. and he purposely is trying to like talk the guy down you know david i'm gonna give you a, you had a great comment from one yeah. of the people here david yeah. they like one of the um people watching this said that they like the energy yeah. and um i think that that is something that really does show here 
Yeah. I, I'm going to actually just interrupt you a little bit on yes. the Lennon story because I actually have 27 people. <laughs> okay. Can I just say the one last line that Lennon says? You got it. Go. The punch line. Go ahead. He says, at the end of the day, he's, he doesn't say at the end of the day because he would never word anything like that, Lennon, but he, he says, you know, I'm just putting words together and having fun. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And he goes, that's all we all do. That's all Zimmerman does, meaning Dylan. And I found that very inspiring because that's not, you know, in a way that like I'm putting colors together and just trying to have fun. And if something works, it works. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And that's sort of my approach. Ah, well, the story actually was a great story. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, number eight is Bonnie McAllister. So hers is called Aurora Borealis, and it was those semicircles of the blues and the greens and the green blues circling that woman. But it wasn't the woman that was attracting. It was all that hair, that blue gray hair. And I mean, you didn't really care so much about the face. And so the star of this work is the fiber. And um, so I was curious about this fiber, the title, the tool she uses, and get ready for a very, very interesting um, explanation. So, Bonnie? Hi, Roberta. Thank you. Hi, for Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. I just want to let everybody know that my name is Bonnie Mac Allister. It's labeled as Mick Allister in the slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, to me, the face is important, but um, the Fiber is sourced, the hair particularly from Sweden, on the Isle of Gotland, it's pretty remote. And you could take a boat, but generally you'll fly uh, on a small plane from Stockholm, which is what I did. Um, the uh, historic city of Visby is there, and um, that's really the only way you can get to it. And the sheep are uh, notorious for their beautiful fiber. And I love that. Um, something that I, as a fiber artist, I do um, engage in some fiber tourism while I travel. And I make sure that I bring home and, and source um, locally or internationally fibers and then incorporate them into my work. The idea of Aurora Borealis is you can only see it in certain parts of the world distinctly. Um, it's there, but we can't see it as well in Pennsylvania. Um, but in the north, uh, in the Lapland in particular, the aurora is really, really strong. So that's what I was referencing in this piece. And you also, and you said, also said, go ahead. Go ahead. Something, about, Something your about your tool. Oh, I use a felting tool that I got from a blacksmith. Um, so it's this really fine needle. It's, it's much sharper than what you would use to sew. But instead of sewing in and out with thread, you take the perforation of the sharp needle through felt. And that's what forms the stitch. The felt comes through and it seals and it's permanent. Um, yeah, generally my work is um, 10 by 10 or within those dimensions. I just saw a question. Um, this one is, uh, the radius is eight inches. Hmm. Looks monumental. monumental. Somebody else Somebody had a question? Okay. I, um, have question. I have a question for Bonnie. Bonnie, I have admired your work for years, years and years. And I don't know if we ever actually met at the Plastic Club. Well. But, um, it looks like you've done um, stitching and, um, uh, and needle, needle felting. Is that... Generally, your your um, and and I use textiles. Um, so I so like, some are recycled textiles. I've met you many times. I bought the Plastic Club T-shirts from you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. I've that a lot. <laughs> I can't see your face right now. That's the trouble. Okay, so um, tell me about your talent. I can't, I can't see, it can't see my screen. Yeah. Um, no, this is not a self-portrait. I have done self-portraits. I do a lot of. Um, portraits of women who I think are heroic, either archetypically or um, as modern women who are movers and shakers. Um, like I've done Malala, um, I've done Michelle Obama, um, AOC, some of the younger Congress people, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I know I've been hanging your work for, uh, you know, the, over the last year and I have noticed it. And I know we have a number of people who are fiber artists and are interested in fiber art. And um, it's always nice. We have some work in this exhibit that's two dimensional and some that's three dimensional and of course yours is dimensional. And, you know, we welcome all kinds of um, entries into these exhibits and your work is phenomenal. It's just that hair is, it's, you know, I want to touch it. <laughs> Yeah, it is three dimensional. And one of the reasons why sometimes I frame it is because I'm afraid people will touch it and damage the fiber. Ah, and, and people would want to touch it, believe me. <laughs> yeah, <they do. laughs> so thank you very much. Um, really, really nice work. Um, number nine, Alina Ong, Isolation. And we also will have a, a second picture from Alina. Um, you know, the solitude of this central image is what had attracted me to it. I mean, it just felt like there was um, solitude and the diagonal um, lines of the trees pointing to the um, hut also reinforced that. And you stayed within the image because the outline in blue of the roof and the, uh, even the shadows reinforced, stay here with this hut. You didn't really wander out into the foreground. But then I noticed the windows. If you look in the windows of the door, you see the reflection outside. You see trees and maybe mountains also. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's like the reflection of the soul of a person, the eyes of a person reflecting their soul. It gave you the sense that this house is the stand-in for a person, really, the isolation of a person. And um, she just, these cool, cool colors certainly reinforced isolation. So um, Alina kindly forwarded me her earlier version of this work and explained its history. So could you take over? Right. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay. It, it, she's here, right? We, we can hear you. Okay, good. This is my first time using Zoom. <laughs> okay, um, this was a part of my Inktober project from last year. Uh, for those who may not know, it's an annual uh, challenge uh, in which for every single day of October, you do a piece in ink. And um, I went with blue just to be a little bit different because um, I was tired about grayscale and that's pretty much all there is to this. Um, and I followed a theme for 2019, which was uh, things like buildings or pieces of architecture like doors or um, windows just so like I don't spend every single day thinking what shall I paint today you know um, and I sh like this little hut like okay probably an example of how I kept winging it every single day despite having some kind of plan like uh, the left hand side totally fine the right hand side I totally messed up um, I was like, let me draw some trees. I'm like, nope, that did not work. So I ended up like scanning it and pretty much redrawing everything using Procreate in my iPad um, just to like make the background blend in with uh, the left hand side, which came out all right. Um, Tina, can you put the other image on? She, we have the other image from her. There it is. Can you, okay. can you see that? Okay. So you can see the background is much more fussy, much more diverting from the central image. I mean, it's still beautiful. <laughs> I didn't mean it wasn't beautiful, but not for isolation, not as isolated. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was meant to look a little bit more um, distinct as trees, but then I, the problem with ink is that sometimes it does what it wants. Um, That's the beauty too, right? Yeah, and I, I uh, let's see, and, I was still like, I had a limited time then than I do now for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not salvaging this through traditional means. Let me just take it into like my digital um, programs. And yeah, I pretty much just read your everything. And as well as just cleaning up stray marks that, you know, occur when you scan. But you did a beautiful job and I, I loved getting the before and after and they're both beautiful. And um, this really does feel like isolation and um, thank you for describing the process. And also I didn't realize that it was a month long um, 
that you had every day you had to do for a month with some form of ink. That's really intriguing. Maybe we'll follow up <laughs> on that. Um, well, in the future, if anybody ever wants to see my sketchbook, um, you know, I got 31 of them. All oh, together. absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the idea of sketchbooks and sharing sketchbooks is a great idea. So maybe we'll, we'll follow up on that. Thank you very much. Um, Bonnie Shorsky. Um, so the, this is called South iPhone Tintype. So it, beside the fact that it was a pretty amazing work, I just was puzzled by what's an iPhone Tintype? And so of course I was gonna have to contact her and talk about her work and ask what, whatever is that about. And um, the piece itself is pretty amazing. Um, it took me a while to realize when I didn't see blue that it was really because the guy's playing the blues, duh. <laughs> Sorry. But what I, I like is how she used all these different elements in there. If you look at the wording of the word South, which is a cruciform against the Afro-American person who is in a dark suit and probably in dark skin. I didn't know or not if that was intentional, but you end up having a history of the South with hangings and if the South was a cruciform on purpose. But it certainly for me start really making me think about the history of things um, and whether or not she intended that, she can talk to that, but it's certainly the power of something to make you think even and think about things is what is so wonderful about art. Um, I liked how she has these white um, rectangle areas on either side and dark areas focusing it. You just have this very strong focusing in on the player. So Bonnie, can you talk about your process and where you get your photos from that you use? And if you could address the word South in there. Okay, well, let me just first talk about what an iPhone tintype is. Mm -hmm. And um, what I've been doing recently is it's just an app, a very primitive type of app that you can download onto your iPhone. And what I like about it is um, similar to what John Stritzinger saying. So there's sort of a accident that you, you don't have to, a lot of control. You've got this primitive iPhone, you've got this fairly camera in an iPhone, you have a fairly primitive um, application and it, you, I, what I do is I pick a situation that looks interesting to me and it does its thing. And then I can decide to select it and then work on it a little bit more in my digital dark room or not, or how, whatever I want to do, do with them. And um, what I like, what's why I'm drawn to it is the mood. It, it gives a very strong mood and it reminds me, I'm very partial to early photographies, uh, the pictorialism. And this kind of gives me, a, they did all kinds of things to manipulate their neg negatives um, to create wonderful moods in the, in the pictures. And this was the original argument, a, a movement that was for, um, advocating that photography was a high art. So now I've got this high tech world that I'm living in, but a old tech early mood, and I'm just drawn to that. And I like working with, with the accident. So this was, I was simply at a concert at South, which is a really good jazz club and dinner club on North Broad Street. A friend of mine's, uh, this is one of her, com the person, people in her combo, she's a jazz pianist. And I just saw this and I liked it. And actually, some of the things that draws me to it is some of the things that you talked about, the highlighting of the S in the, uh, in the bass. But I also, you have the, sim the symbol, the round, there's a background of round, Mm -hmm. uh, circle discs around yeah. the south and around the sim symbols. I don't know if you can. Yeah, you can see them. It's, it's oh, great. Oh, I can, uh, yeah, if you can see it there. Lovely. Um, so, but it's, it's just a process I've been intrigued 
by for the last couple of years. And I, and it's this giving up, it's giving over to technology and then recapturing it, the process and this connection between mood and modern that's kind of Beautiful. jumbled together that I appreciate. And that. Great job. Um, could you give the name of the app or if you don't have it right at your tip of the well, tongue? I think it's just called Tintype. Um, Let's just see where it's at. Uh, I've got my iPhone here, so it's called Tintype. It, Tintype, and I'm, but we'll, I'm just trying to see. I can't. It opens up before I can get a uh, a manufacturer. But I could get. I can look that up on. You know, if you just look up Tintype app, um, there there may be many of them. But this is. I can or I can put it down if I can find it in the um, chat in a minute. You know, I'll look it up in a minute. Well, I have to say you fooled me. The picture fooled me. I, I always assumed you had taken a picture of, a, of a, an earlier photograph and then used your app to continue to work on it. So this was even more um, interesting in terms of what this app does and, and what you did with it. So thank you very much for your um, discussion of it. It's a fabulous piece. Um, thank you. Hope to see you next month. <laughs> thank you. Um, Alice Chung is Inspirational Blues. Um, there is blue. <laughs> there is definitely blue in this. And what I loved about this composition, I mean, many, many things, but I like this swirling sense of um, blues, the circular motion of that. It just felt like it was very tumultuous. And um, I loved the orange houses that formed triangles that gave it some sense of stability, though they did seem like they were falling into this stream. And I, I wanted to know from her what inspired this painting. Was it from her imagination, a recollection, a photograph? Um, and what was the feeling of this tumult? Was that because there was something else going on? So if you could, um, Alice, if you could talk about your wonderful painting. I don't think she's here, Roberta. She was here. Wasn't she here? No? Ah, well, I got an answer back, so I assume she was, she was planning on coming. Okay, so what she said was she visited Croatia five years ago, and she loved the fantastic scenery. So she went again there last year. So first of all, when she was painting this, she started to imagine a dark blue sea with her fantastic memory of Dubrovnik. And the painting being abstract is, was inspirational in her mind with a combination of beautiful scenery that she had a memory. The red roof of, her, of the houses um, helped release this blue for her because they're orange, orange red, so they're complementary colors and it just, kept releasing blue for her. And it made her feel comfortable and felt happy again. So it's quite a lovely story. I'm sorry she isn't here in person uh, to tell you that. But anyway, it's a wonderful piece. So now we're going to have Tina Chung talk about study for free falling. And she has also another um, photo to go with this. When I first saw this photo, I thought, okay, that's nice and weird. <laughs> I thought that's really great. I love it. All this stuff sort of thrown together and it ends up being really interesting. Two weeks ago, I saw a picture in the New York Times of one of the astronauts coming down um, from that, um, you know, from the International Space Station. He had this huge, huge parachute and, um, you know, it was tinted dark and he's falling into the sea. And I thought, oh my goodness, Maybe it wasn't so weird. Anyway, um, I was intrigued by why she called it a study. And if she considered, um, I mean, you could tell that it's an assemblage, but did she consider the assemblage to be the piece of art? Or did she consider the photograph of the assemblage to be the piece of art? And it turned out there's actually one more layer than I even imagined. So Tina, could you talk about um, what this piece is all about? And we'll have to also see the other piece too. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I'm continuing the study of, of like what it means to be in quarantine and what it means to be locked down. So this seems to be the theme I'm returning to on and off. And when I saw the the theme for the blues, well, mostly I work in monochromatic color. So 
I really have glue. <laughs> and I said, oh, I have this sculpture. I really want to put this little piece of sculpture in. Um, and I, I'll show you this in my studio. Um, and this is the little sculpture that's hanging. It's a three-dimensional piece that hangs from my ceiling. Um, and I, I could not photograph it to make it fit in an online exhibition to save my life. I, I took so many photos and I just I didn't have enough space in my studio to get a good background. So finally I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take the photograph and I'm going to collage it with a background. So it looks like this guy is not just, float he's still free falling, but he's not floating in the middle of nowhere. It looks great. Um, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you couldn't do it because it's such a nice piece in itself. <laughs> yeah, it turned into something totally different. So now it's no longer a sculpture, it's a collage. <laughs> it, although the, the sculptural piece still exists. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've been really playing with these ideas of masculinity and femininity and, um, gender roles, um, and how it's all kind of topsy-turvy right now. So the idea that we have this little, you know, green plastic soldier man who would be like parachuting anyway, but now he's parachuting with a little woman's hat uh, probably from the 50s. Um, it, it just seemed to speak to me about a lot of things that are going on right now. Wow. Uh, that's even another level on that piece I didn't, you know, even see in that. It's, um, it's it's very interesting, and uh, to me, all the questions it raises, you have people that do land art, and then they take photographs of it. So the question is, what is the art, the land, what they did with the land or the photograph? And once she showed me this picture, you know, the question, or they all are considered to be art. Um, and the different, you, you have a whole series of photographs that are probably very interesting of the ones you rejected. <laughs> If you, pro you know, prop them. I mean, it's pretty intriguing what else you can do with those. Anyway, there's no doubt that Tina's inventive, <laughs> imaginative, and resourceful. <laughs> um, so I love the piece, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so Kimberly Garland. So Tina's not the only one that was doing assemblages. Um, Kimberly um, has a lot of stuff here. And, you know, as a viewer, I kept trying to impose a person on it. You know, we viewers sometimes try to take things that are abstract and maybe formless and try to make them into something that's manageable to us or human to us. So at the top, I could see this, is it a, a blue man? Um, is it a green headed elephant with a blue body? It definitely was sparkly and tactile. So, um, you know, I was just intrigued whether this was just free forming or, What's the process? What was the idea behind it? So Kimberly, could you talk about your whole art process and, uh, and how you looked at some of these materials? Um, sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay, I've done Zoom, but I've never spoken over Zoom. So here we go. Um, huh. Well, I <laughs> think, <laughs> I think the, the, the process for assemblage for me really I mean, it starts with the materials. It starts with found materials. Um, either I find materials out on the street while I'm walking and think, what a beautiful piece of garbage. I want to make art out of that. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, a lot of times through thrift stores. Um, this is part of a, I don't know if I'd even call it a series, a small series of pieces I, I would call vessels um, made during quarantine um, and really, I think that being isolated, I hope I'm answering your question. I'm just talking, but. No, you're, I, you're doing fine. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. I think, I think that being isolated gave me a different way of looking at the materials that I repurpose into art and a different relationship with them. Because I think I started thinking more, as a lot of us have, about mm -hmm. connection and disconnection um, and what that means in our world. And I think how much we rely on people even when we feel isolated. So more of us were, you know, ordering things online, getting things delivered, necessities delivered, um, and really relying on people in a different way that seemed to come to the forefront. Not, I think often we neglect to think, where did this come from? Where did that come from? So the base of this sculpture is two um, containers that had mushrooms in them that we got from veggie delivery and that are blue. Um, and so I, I kind of, I guess I go more organically from the material itself 
Um, I certainly don't sculpt to make it look like something. It, it, it evolves for me um, and from the materials. And I, I do a lot with my collecting of sorting and colors and sorting again and sorting again and um, maybe <laughs> a little obsessively. Um, and, then, and then see how they come together from the materials themselves. And I guess then maybe the, maybe it's sort of magical thinking of the meaning for me coming through. I don't know, but um, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it comes about. And I guess I just look at the materials as sort of these vessels connecting us. So, and then I'm changing the story of the vessels. So like the mushrooms came, mushroom containers came from a factory at where people were involved and then were probably shipped Rob to a- Rob Cox factory. has joined the meeting. Oh, and uh, you know, and then came to us and then they would go into the recycling container, but now I've changed that. So anyway, I'm, that's the basics. That's such a nice metaphor for art, you know, and the artist. I, I loved your telling of all of this. So where do you store all this material? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, at the moment in uh, quarantine, I, I share an apartment with my mother and I use our dining room as my studio. Uh, so it's, I'm in my bedroom now because you don't want to see my studio. It's <laughs> um, <Probably do. laughs> it's stored. It's stored in a very, um, yeah, uh, random yeah. way. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much for sharing it. Your piece was great, and um, I hope to see you next month. Thanks, Roberta. So we have a very, very special guest next, um, Betty McDonald, um, two crossed feet. And I hope you're all as comfortable right now watching this salon as it seems like the sitter in this print is. It definitely conveys, you know, just laying back, sitting down. And the print reminded me in many ways of a Japanese print. The Japanese in um, the late 19th, early 20th century did a lot of um, cropping. And their, that whole process was um, influential to the um, Impressionists who started doing these very interesting, intriguing um, points of view. They were also influenced by the camera because you can be cropping in, in those ways. So it was, that was one thing that attracted me um, to it. The other thing was the stability, the feeling of stability, even though she has a lot of diagonals, like the diagonal of the pants the diagonals of the stool. It just feels very, very stable and just sitting back. Um, so Betty, if you can talk about this piece and talk about how you got this effect of the um, cloth. Okay. Or the drapery. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I was sitting at the sketch club with my feet crossed and try to think of something to do. And I thought, oh, I kind of like the cross feet. They were peaceful. They were comfortable. Um, the little chair is a funny little wooden chair. And I had a wonderful time just doing this quiet and peaceful and comfortable and sort of lazy, which is one of my problems. I tend to take to be lazy about things. And I have done body parts before. I've done one piece of work that was my eye and one that was a hand. And I thought, well, why not feet? And I do often sit that way. I still do. I always wear blue jeans. So I thought, well, they would have to be blue jeans and everything else in the browns because it was wooden furniture and brown shoes and what have you. The only thing I wasn't sure about the cross hatching was, was a lazy out to do something with the space. I, I didn't want it all white. I wanted a tone on it. And uh, that was my easy out was to just cross hatch it. So it's a way of cut. So you did that by hand, the cross, it's cross hatching. Yeah. You didn't print in like a piece of fabric or something. 
No, no. I, okay. I just scratched it all with a linoleum tool. And uh, I, I just had a wonderful time doing it because it was a comfortable position to sit in, an easy, quiet thing to do. It, I, you know, nothing moved, <laughs> including my feet. <laughs> and I just had a good time with it. So it could have been called self-portrait. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I originally called it uh, my two crossed feet. I guess that's the proper title is my two crossed feet with the my in front of it because it's fine. <laughs> I, I think it's really inspirational to hear anything can be the subject of art. She's just sitting there looking at her crossed feet and then she has this beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, before that, Kimberly collects a lot of junk, she keeps her mushroom boxes, and then she has a beautiful piece of um, art. I mean, art comes from so many places. It's certainly very inspirational to hear where all these different artists are telling how they got the sources of their, their amazing pieces. Um, thank you, Betty. That was really very, very inspirational. Um, Amy Siegel, um, Poolside 70 Umbrellas. Is, is Amy here? Can you hear me? Oh, hi. 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 hi oh, you, you, look, you look like your piece. <laughs> exactly. I dressed you. Really. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so Amy said um, when I contacted her that her piece was inspired by fringed, brightly colored striped umbrellas and the turquoise of the pool. And um, she just did a beautiful job of capturing that feeling. Um, so could you tell us about um, your materials? Um, particularly that white really fooled me. Um, I thought it was something else. And, and, how, and how you come with your inspiration and how you assemble things. And I understand this is part of a series, correct? Yeah, I actually just finished the second piece in the series, which is inspired by this 60s caftan I'm wearing today. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So this one is inspired by the 1970s. I love vintage. I actually like curate and sell vintage housewares as well as doing art. So this kind of combined both of my loves. Um, I still have not gotten to take a dip in a pool this summer, but I'm not a fan of summer and I've been dying for cool turquoise waters. So that kind of got me just stuck on the blues before I even knew that you were doing blues for your exhibit. Uh -huh. And um, I use all kinds of scraps of things for my work. Um, the white you were referring to, I know it looks like fabric. It's a, yeah. a handmade Good. embroidered paper. Um, once people know how I create, my friends like to give me things. I had a friend who traveled to Nepal and actually brought back handmade papers for me. And that was one of the best gifts I've ever received. So that is what I used for that. Um, and there's a bunch of, you can see the like gridded turquoise I was in the process of creating this piece and looked down on, and I had a spiral notebook there, and that was the cardboard cover of a spiral notebook I had sitting by me that just reminded me so much of a swimming pool. So that's those pieces. Um, I used some recycled, um, some envelope, security envelope interiors that in my pieces, and acrylic paint. So. So, so is that paper embossed, or is there stitching in it, or? There's yeah, it's an embroidered paper. Ah, it's lovely. Thanks. Yeah, I, I thought it was pieces of sheet that was embroidered. So, yeah. um, do you separate your fabrics into colors, or do you have, or you just <laughs> keep going through piles? Yeah, that's actually one of my consistent problems is how to organize all my scraps of things because <laughs> um, I have a lot of things that have patterns and not just colors, and so I never know how to organize them. And I like to work from just kind of a big multicolored pile on my table when I'm in the middle of something. But then when I go to start on something new, I really want them to all be separated and organized. So if anyone has any organizational advice, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, let me know too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you work on more than one piece at a time or do you try to keep, you know, once you start, you try to get that one finished? Um, good question. I think sometimes I, I like to finish things when I start them, but sometimes if I get stuck on a piece, I actually go back to a piece that I got stuck on months ago. And that just happened to me this past week. I just finished a piece that was unrelated to the, my poolside series because I was kind of stuck just on one piece I'm working on. 
So it all kind of depends on where the inspiration's flowing at the moment. Yeah. Oh, it's just a fabulous piece. When I saw it, it was so happy. But when you, I'm very surprised when I see you, I was expecting an older woman because when you said insp your inspiration was the poolside 70s, I said, this is going to be an old lady. <laughs> I'm older than I look. I was born in the 70s. <laughs> so. Well, anyway, nice to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Number 15 is Angelo Benedetto. Did I say that right? And um, he has, we're going to have two photos from him. So when I saw this picture, I said, oh, wouldn't I like those socks and sneakers? I might not ever wear them, but boy, <laughs> you just said, God, I have to have these. They were just so like in your face and just lively. And it's such a wonderful composition. He has the stratas, you know, that big sidewalk, gray, gravelly strata that contrasts with the darker uh, motley curb area with a very small area of gray. What I like is he has three different values. So he's very, very good about having values. And these values really, really showed off those sneakers, those shoelaces, those triangles. Um, just a wonderful photo. You look at it and you know it immediately stops you. You know, when I see the exhibit, I went right on, I said, click. <laughs> Have to see that bigger. So we also have a um, another version of that. But do you want to talk about where you did this and how you did this and how you got your inspiration? Is Angela here? I don't think he's here. Oh well, I have an answer then. <laughs> okay, I just assume when I hear get an email back, they're coming. Um, so. He took this photo spontaneously as he left his apartment building and that adjoined the Academy of Music. And the person was just sitting on the steps on Locust Street at the stage entrance. And he pointed his camera at the shoes and took one image. And, um, and he likes, he prides himself on being able to do balanced compositions with texture. And he sent us another photo um, that also was in this series, I believe. Am I right, Tina? Don't we have another one? Am I mixing this up with another? Yeah. No, you, so, there's one. <laughs> so he also just started using this as um, further images for a series. Um, you know, it, it, it's also interesting. It's sort of like the, the shoes and socks underwater. Um, you know, the cleanliness of the other one is quite striking. And this is definitely a different work, a different point of view. So um, I'm sorry he's not here, uh, but his photo's here and it's wonderful. <laughs> so our next one is um, Bob Moore. And this is called Broken Center City Store Windows, a topic near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I mean, luckily I was away during the Center City window breaking, but it, I, since I live in Center City, I thought, oh no, what a horrible thing. And then you see this beautiful picture. <laughs> so this is really, again, about how art can make reality really beautiful. And um, vandalism is ugly, but this picture is not ugly. And uh, this shows how vandalism could, Bob has shown us how vandalism can be made beautiful. We don't want too many examples of that in the future, do we? Um, <laughs> but anyway, I love his lines, his varied lines, the zigzagging lines and the different texture of the lines and the strong diagonals in the, in the blue areas. And we have, um, so I was intrigued about a general description of the process um, and also if he had the original photo. So if we could put up, he gave us a series of three and Bob is going to briefly describe his process and also talk about his two, Tuesday Zoom sharing. Bob? Okay. Uh, on the far left is the original photo. Uh, my, my motivation in going out and walking was more journalism, uh, documenting reality than anything else. Then I brought it back to my uh, uh, place and started processing it. And I used a couple apps. Uh, this is uh, uh, an app uh, that's, that's it's called Kandinsky, and this is one called Abstractism. So if we can go back to the original uh, piece, uh, there were 11 layers, mm -hmm. and I combined uh, 
the Kandinsky is barely visible, but you can you can sort of see it in the broken lines and some mm -hmm. of the lines. And uh, um, so uh, I also want to say that the fact that that blue light sort of means that the company, uh, this was a store window, the company's still in business. This is not like going into uh, uh, Yugoslavia and, and shooting the ruins. This is uh, uh, damage to an ongoing business. And I'm like you, uh, Roberta, I'm glad we haven't uh, seen much more of this. So could you talk a little about your Tuesday um, Zoom share? So people who sure. aren't aware of it will... Sure, folks, uh, I encourage you to come by. The uh, uh, Zoom address is on the Plastic Club Zoom page, plasticclub.org forward slash Zoom. And basically, it's a, it's a group of people that talk about what they're doing now or what they're going to do next. It's, it's less of a focus on finished works and more on process and ideas of different ways of doing things. It's at 7 p.m. on Tuesdays every week. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. So uh, everybody's welcome to join. The address is on, on the Zoom page. And, and we thank Bob for doing that. And a lot of people are participating in it. And, and um, really, really good feedback has come from there. So thank you very much. And, um, Again, I loved your pieces and I liked seeing the changes. Um, Joellen Ross, is, is Joellen here? Yes. Okay, Joellen you may remember from last exhibit. Remember that yellow piece? I mean, it was a yellow piece. <laughs> it was a yellow piece that also had um, a lot of texture in it. And it was, you know, mon monochromatic. And, you know, she basically made it interesting by enlivening and giving some compositional elements to the yellow. So when I saw this piece, I thought, well, maybe she works monochromatically. I mean, it's various shades of blue, but it is, you know, the blues. And one of the things I really liked about this piece, it's called um, Painted Into a Corner. I mean, you feel like you just go right into that corner. And very important to getting you there is that white area that is, um, not, you know, it's all broken up with shades and blues and stuff. So um, it's just a very strong piece. Do you want to talk about it? Because you also have, um, you have other things to say about corners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started painting corners and then I asked, subsequent, uh, retrospectively asked myself, why am I painting corners? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, very well. You yeah, speak very I well. Asked yeah, I was asking myself, why are you painting corners? And then it dawned on me, it's perhaps because I have felt cornered since November 2016. So um, <clears throat> I, I think that's some of my uh, motivation at this point. Also, um, after doing several paintings of corners, we went to Greece and walked into a museum, and lo and behold, was a painting of a corner done by a Greek artist, Opie Zuni. And so I've subsequently been uh, inspired by her work. I don't necessarily do monochromatic painting. I have been doing more grays and blues lately, uh, just because I like them. And I think too, with hard edge graphic work, which is what I've been doing, too much color uh, makes it look too pop art-ish or too cartoonish, whereas more, uh, more different shades of the same color gives it a more interesting um, mood. So, yeah, no, it's a love. It's a love. It's. I mean, I I was very drawn to it by that. It's three rectangles, and it's just. I mean, you can't just do three rectangles. You have to work on the composition and get it just right. And you did. <laughs> and you know, really, really appreciate you sharing the work. Thank you. Um, Somebody had a question? No. And then, I mean, so Jean, Jean Renzi, the blue vase. And is Jean here? So I figured this one followed very nicely because we have a sense of a corner. It's either a corner on a table or it's a corner, a floor. I wasn't <laughs> exactly sure. But 
this piece um, had really beautiful shades of blue, the light blue, the dark blue, the gray blues, with the um, very lovely activ activated orange tangerine and turn the side corner. And this vase, our plant potter, it looks like, almost like, it looks monumental, but it, I don't know, it's probably a small piece, looks really quite um, interesting. I mean, it's like the subject, it becomes a, a focus, it's um, the star. And you know, who would think the little vase is a star, but by the way he painted it, it becomes so important. Like I said, it feels monumental. Um, so, Jean, can you answer what, you know, was this based on um, a, something you arranged, a still life on photographs? Um, what was your inspiration? Is that a table or is that just into, um, it's on a corner of a floor? Well, it was, uh, it was set up as a um, still life in a class project, okay? And the base maybe was like six by six by six and just sitting there. Um, there might have been other pieces in this setup, but I just picked the, the vase and, you know, uh, was sitting on a, you know, pedestal and I added the um, orange and the light beige in, in there as a, as a background, just not to have white paper there. And um, the whole piece is about eight by 10 inches, um, watercolor, and that's about it. <laughs> Well, for, that's about it. It's quite a beautiful, lovely, lovely piece. And again, he's an artist improving on reality um, because he does know how to paint and how to emphasize things. It's, it's quite lovely. I enjoy seeing your work. Your last piece in the other exhibit was also lovely. Thank you um, very much. So <clears throat> we're in for a treat. Um, Rob Cox joined us. So... <clears throat> You know, I looked at this and said, okay, what the heck? <laughs> what is it? Um, why did he do it? Um, and how do you get them? What, what is it? I mean, as I looked at it closely, it almost looked like a face. You could see like a nose and some eyes and the shadow of the cheeks, though he called it a nest. So, okay, what kind of nest? What's this artist doing? So talk about it. <laughs> Let's hear from you. Rob? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it's it's a, a hornet's nest that's attached to a phone line. And I'd say the hornet's nest is about uh, the size of a large watermelon. Ah. And uh, I was just walking to the, to the state store one day <laughs> and uh, I just took this picture with my cell phone and because I just love the, how the light hit it and how uh, the line divided the space. And, um, you know, it was such a great sunny day that, um, well, that's the great thing about having a cell phone with a good camera is it's always with you. Right. So um, I just, I just liked, uh, I just liked the image and um, that's about it really. Well, it, was, it definitely was intriguing. Somebody once said, it, the best camera you can buy is the one that you'll always have with you. And now in this day and age, it, it is the cell phone and they have become more sophisticated. So thank you for submitting this. It definitely kept raising questions in my mind. What is, what is this? <laughs> so thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. So we're having a return visitor from Dory Miller. Um, Dory, Dory, um, <laughs> Dory always um, has something that raises questions. Dory's an amazing artist. I can't pronounce, I'm going to only give the parentheses. Yeah. Depending the surface series, you can pronounce the rest. So everything about this piece raised questions in my mind. What's, what's the title mean? What, what size is it really? How, what's her process? Um, back forward. And, um, and anyway, she can address all those questions because there's actually stories behind it. A lot yeah. of stories. Yeah. So Dory, 
Hi, hi. Thanks for having me, Roberta. And I, I put this in the chat and I don't know if you saw it, but you're a really incredible interlocutor. I love the way you dialogue with everybody. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> very you're sweet really of you. conversation with all of us and I'm grateful. Um, okay, it's a huge painting. It's 58 by 46. Um, I can't pronounce the name. It's the Sanskrit uh, name for the medicine Buddha, which is what the prompt and inspiration was for this painting. And um, I, I have this series called the Defending Surface Series, and it's a play on words. It's the, it's, it references, it's references something um, on the undisturbed surfaces of the deserts across the world. It's called the cryptobiotic crust. It's a living thing that protects everything that's below it. It's also an argument as I've just come through 10 years of school, art school, it's my defense of being able to work on something that's surface, which is, you know, you kind of get pushed away from. Mm -hmm. So this, but each, each one of them gets a prompt. It's something that I've been thinking about in this one. I was thinking about the medicine Buddha, but at the same time, and this is, <laughs> this is a stretch for, I'm, I think it was for Roberta trying to explain it to her. I was thinking about at the same time, unrelated, how when you say something to someone like, I love you this much, and you spread your arms as wide as you can, or I'm going to give you the, a hug. So I thought, I just kept spreading my arms, and I ended up like, like this, with my hands back to back. And like, that's the biggest hug you can give someone. It's completely embraced around them. So basically what, it, what I did is I painted the silhouette of the medicine Buddha from a reference, and then I split it out to the side so that when you're standing in front of it, it's as if you're being enrobed by it and wrapped around by it. The mythology is that if you simply gaze upon the medicine Buddha, you will be healed. So it was me trying to somehow bestow that and give that through standing in front of the painting. I, I, I just was so intrigued by your whole involvement with the surface, with the story, with the mythology. It was like an immersion in, in Dory Miller. <laughs> And it was just quite, quite, um, you know, inspiring. Now, Dory, you, Dory is being kicked out of her space at PAFA and um, is trying to find a new location for her, um, being an artist um, and doing her work. So if anybody knows where there's a, um, a studio area, um, I don't know how big you're looking at or you, you want to give like a two sentence thing about your needs for a studio. Well, yeah, uh, thank you for, for asking the community, Roberta. I appreciate it. Um, I'm coming out of a really luxurious space. The biggest space I've ever been in was like a 10 by 10 foot square room. Um, so I don't know if that's considered big to a professional artist, but that's the biggest one that I've had so far. So, and, and I also know that whatever room you're in determines the size of the work. So I can adapt. So you're just wanting people that they have some place that is looking to, some space for an artist that... Yes and um, has a little bit of heat, a little bit of windows, air. Yeah, habitable would be nice. <laughs> habitable, habitable. That would be very nice, yes. Roberta, well, Roberta. thank you very much. And, um, thank you. Please let her know. Roberta, no, I think we lost Marie San Martino, I think. Roberta? Um, yeah? Um, somebody's trying to say something. I was just trying to say that Anders Hansen is coming out of a studio uh, oh. on North 11th Street. And he, you might want to talk to Anders. Did you say the name again? Anders Hansen. I know he'll be leaving soon because he's building his own studio in his garden. So, Does Roberta know how I can get in touch with him? He's, he's in the, do you have the book? Do you have the Plastic Club book or not? No, I, I don't. I'm sorry. I'll send, you, I'll send you his email. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Well, that's great. That's really nice when this becomes like a, um, a bulletin board. <laughs> wanted, needed a space. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the next one was Marie Sammartino. And Marie, are you with us still? I think she had to leave. Um, I was just um, interested in her title. She called it Surrender. And when I looked at it, you know, it felt so active. Um, the moving of the swirling blues, the feeling of this surf, um, surf with the white, blue, the dark blue sort of holding things in. I mean, she did have some um, verticals that gave some stability, but I, I just didn't understand this, um, why she called it surrender. So anyway, I'm going to read you her answer. 
Um, so she said, because of social distancing, there's been no parties, we have to wear a mask. Surrender was the start of a whole new collection during this pandemic time. The colors I chose, I thought would show surrender and that she just felt that that's starting her way of painting in this time. Um, and that she just had to surrender to this process. And this was one of the paintings that came out of this sense of surrender. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Paul Vo, we have um, Blue Melancholy Girl in Black Hat. So you, you look at this and does anybody think, oh, is she happy? I wish I could be that happy. <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, if you look at the, the cool colors, um, you look at the downward turn of her mouth, uh, this is just not a happy girl. Um, and even if she, he'd left the face blank and he didn't have the eyes, which don't look happy either, no mouth, it still would have had that feeling of just um, melancholy because his skillful use of these cool blues um, and there are many different shades of blues, which is also very nice to see. That's part of what keeps it interesting. So when I kept looking at the background, you know, if you look at the very top layer, I thought, well, are those figures, are those other figures are there, or is that a cityscape, or what is it? So there's other alternatives between, be, besides those ideas. And Paul, could you address your painting? Yeah, sure. Uh this painting really was uh, based around the theme and the time. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was painted during the heat of the summer. And uh, what I really try to do with my figures is really use the forms to uh, express the, the idea or the aesthetic. Um, and I really uh, arrived at some melancholy summer type of, uh, sensation and started working kind of uh, from that and then developing a portrait. So that's how I arrived at the piece. And did you do it from a, a when you say a portrait, did, was that something that you composed just, you know, um, in your mind from parts and pieces or were you looking at a photograph or um, another, or another work or a model? What was the inspiration for the, the body and the face? Well, yeah, um, it was from imagination. I mean, I was working on a series and um, some of the forms that I've been using kind of came through and uh, there was a little residue from that. But uh, for the most part, it's from imagination. And then I guess um, the idea of the hat came in and then, you know, I'd look for references that would allow me to kind of use that in uh, the right perspective. So. Oh, that's great. So you also addressed the background. It, you did, it wasn't the figures or the cityscape. What, can you tell us about your background? Yeah, just a simple gradient with uh, like a little shadow in the rear and um, just really looking forward with a kind of like a brighter future or kind of present or the forefront. Yeah. Well, thank you for the sharing. I, I like that notion that all of a sudden, as you're composing, you know, the idea of the hat came in. I mean, it's this artist who's composing and reacting to what's on the um, substrate before him. And you did a really nice job. And it's also interesting to hear that it's a, you know, combination of things that you were also working on previously. Very creative. And it's a creative process. So I appreciate you sharing about the process. Thank you. Um, Bu Yong Lee. Um, so she asked me to keep her late in this, so I did. <laughs> so when you look at this, your eye goes right to that um, orange red spot. I mean, of course you have that fringe light against dark, um, the different blues, but I love that that dot just drew me in and so it drew my eye to that oval and it looked like a lot of texture in that oval. So I was intrigued by that. Um, the fringe paint, it was not fringe, but it's painting, um, that she did that light blue also felt very textured. So I was interested in about, she just has you know, very few areas, but it just has a lot of interest. So could you address your, um, how you did your painting, how you got your texture? 
it, it, Buyong, are you here? No? Hello? Hi, Buyong. Hello? Hello? Can you hear we me? We can hear you, yes. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, well, uh, sometime a period that before um, I played with thin paints, uh, just pour on the canvas, you know, then wait until it dries, and uh, until it just uh, um, until form is a natural formation itself. So then I meant to make a circle in the center, but it just elongated and <laughs> probably more interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I just decided to frame maybe. <laughs> So that is the, just a simple reason <laughs> it happened. And, and what about the, or the little spot? Oh, the spot, that was the, actually the last minute, you know, um, everything was so blue and calm. I wanted to be evoke something, change mood. So I was just red dots on the... And, and that's just like a, a wonderful explanation. That's the artist again, reacting to the surface of what, what is happening in the process. She tried to do a circle, it wasn't a circle, so what? It's quite beautiful and she kept going from there. And um, you know, she it was too quiet and she just activated it by that perfect red dot, which captured me in the first place. So thank you very much. It's really a lovely, lovely painting and looking forward to your um, submission in the next exhibit. Thank you. Um, Neela Kuhn, Kun, is it, how do you pronounce your name? Kun? Is she here? Neela? Yeah, hi. This is called hi. Blue Wave, and um, it's this very dramatic interweaving of these wavy dotted blue and pink and whitish lines. Um, motion, you know, it just is, how did she make this? What is, what's going on? Go ahead, tell us. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I use a camera and everything is done in the camera. I don't uh, play with it on the computer. So I worry about the depth of field, how much is in focus and how long the time exposure is. And I try to get the lines as sharp as I can. I use the camera as a tool, just like the painter uses a brush as a tool. And it involves a lot of motion. Um, it's a long exposure, uh, two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. And it depends, it's light. Uh, this is all light at night. So it depends um, if I have a clear night or if it's raining out, everything affects the final image. What are you pointing the camera at? Are you pointing it at a, like a street light or a car light or just the atmosphere? Uh, I'm pointing it at um, car lights, uh, signs, all sorts of things that I find outside. So you said that this is part of a 15-year series? Yeah. <laughs> tell us about that. I mean, that's... <laughs> I Cameras have... have changed a lot since then, too, right? It, it has. Um, when I first started out, I was using a manual camera. Now I use a digital camera. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because I get to see what... I have what I captured and I can make corrections and go back and change things pretty fast because um, you don't have to be. I'm still there. Right. You don't have to wait for it to be developed. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it's quite a lovely piece. It's, um, it definitely fits the theme, the blues. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Michael? Win. So, I don't have to introduce Michael. If you haven't seen him and seen him and seen him, 
<laughs> you haven't been to the Classic Club. <laughs> anyway, his, his piece is called Duet in Blue. And um, when I looked at it, I thought I saw the influence of Leger. Um, and I, I, you know, so I'm curious about that. And I kept, I had several questions about these figures. So the faces aren't faces, they almost look like masks, or they look like masks to me. And I just was wondering if that's part of what he's um, portraying is people putting on masks or whatever. Um, and I, I didn't know the fact that it looked like one person was white and one person was Afro-American, whether or not he was reacting to events of today or it was not. And um, the title Duet in Blue, to me felt um, hopeful, you know, that some, there's a harmony. I mean, I know you could have dissonance and be called um, harmony. You could be called, you could call it harmony, but Michael's more old fashioned than that, I bet. <laughs> um, you know, it can't be one of those avant-garde musicians. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, so could you address this piece, Michael? Uh, yeah, this is, um, well, first of all, it's not, they're not masks. They're just really uh, sort of a silhouette of two uh, faces. Okay. Uh, and it's true, I was working on this during the Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I purposely did make the other figure uh, an African-American. Okay. Um, and the, the green and the red and the black also is it something from the, you know, a black national flag. Uh, but basically it's a composition of forms, which is the way I work. I, always, I work flat for the most part. And um, it's just two figures uh, somewhat broken up in a pattern. And um, that's all it is really. It's, it's just a design. And are you influenced by Leger in, in, in how you paint or? Synthetic cubism is a language that I like a lot. And that was, uh, you know, Picasso in, in the 20s and Leger in the teens in the 20s. Yes, I do like that language. And it's mm -hmm. a language, like realism is a language. Uh, this is a language that I work with. And, um, and I have always worked. I've always liked Cezanne, I think, because, I, you know, I have one eye. I don't, one eye doesn't work. And I've always, I think mm -hmm. that for me, I work in flat planes because perhaps, you know, depth isn't working for me. I never could hit a baseball. And I felt bad about that. Maybe it's because I just never knew where the ball was. So um, Cezanne works in planes. And that's the way, Cezanne was sort of the big influence in my life. Mm -hmm. Planes work for me, so it's the flat. I work in flat and a flat design generally, and uh, try to make it uh, harm. You know, the colors balance out. Well, Michael couldn't have given a better introduction to next month's um, exhibit, um, influenced by great masters, because he named you know he named movements yeah. and people in them. I do, of course, keep plugging that. I would love to see all of you in the next month's exhibit. Um, and it, it's a lovely piece. I mean, I, um, I thought it, it worked really well. And, um, and there was somewhat different than some of your other ones. I mean, not the, um, I, maybe the two figures. I mean, usually you have like a figure of Cynthia or, you know, I mean, it just felt a little bit different, a little more um, balanced in some ways. Yeah, I work in different ways. Really. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't have one style, really. I try to make whatever I do work in whatever way. And this certainly did work. I mean, it's a, it's a lovely, lovely piece. The colors, you know, it's a, not a good uh, picture because this, the bottom side, the bottom part is sort of faded out. It, I never got a really good, a good shot uh, of this thing. It could be a little better. But well, we think, thank you for at least submitting that. So Colleen Brand, Blue Calm. I don't know. If she, I don't know if she's here, Colleen. 
Um, I didn't hear back from her, but I, I liked the piece. Um, you know, it sort of fit in with the theme that Bob Lee and Rick Wright had been doing. They were talking about Rothko. I feel like the, you know, with the, the three big areas and the, um, the synergy of these colors against each other and the vibration, it just felt like there's a lot of sense of movement, even though it's just three, um, two big planes and a smaller one. So I thought it was a lovely piece. And I, again, I would have liked to have heard about um, what her, if she had any influences on that. Um, Katie Lynn, I'm not sure she's here either. Okay, um, I'm gonna just briefly talk so we can have Diane Podolsky talk about hers. So uh, Katie's um, here. Katie? for me, it, the even it's called the red line. The star of it wasn't that red, um, curvy line. For me, I like that reddish, pinkish area against that um, blue triangular shape on the upper left quadrant. It just drew my eye in there um, and made me just look at, go up towards the other blues, go up towards the white, um, white modeled area brought my eye down to the circles. Um, and then it brought me up to the red line, but the red line wasn't what at least first attracted me. It just helped me travel through the painting. Um, she may have felt different and other people may feel differently. Um, it's just how I, you know, obviously the color is going to um, draw your eye in. Um, but it's a very, very beautiful piece and um, she integrates all the areas. So um, Diane Podolsky, yeah, hi. Hi. So it's called Big Plants, and um, I love those big swirly circles, and there were different size um, circles, and they were very active, and I could just feel this activity in that girl's brain just swirling around with all these different ideas she had, just captured this brain movement in there just by using this kind of symbol, you know, a symbolism in there. So um, if you could briefly, you know, just talk, I know it's a complex process, just, you know, briefly address your print and also tell us a little about, a little bit about the um, Zoom um, salon that you're holding next week. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know why my camera's not working, as long as you can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, all right, that's fine. Then. Um, I think the funniest thing about this piece is the one I made prior to it that did not turn out at all. And I like um, thinking about that, like why didn't this piece not turn out? Um, the original piece was much narrower, so the sky wasn't as big. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually do have a picture of that up on my blog. Um, and the girl sitting on the other side and her hands are around her knees. And a friend of mine asked, why is she holding a broken golf club? <laughs> and, and I was like, well, what do you mean? And you can't, I mean, I looked and I'm like, it does look like she's holding a broken golf club. So when I redid the piece, I changed the position of her hands and I made the sky bigger. Um, but a reduction linen cut basically is a process where you are cutting away every time you print a color. So because there's white in this, the very first thing I had to do was cut away all the white um, so it, it would not print. And, and I don't know how many people involved here have done any printmaking, but um, when you do a reduction print, it's sort of a, a test in logic um, because you really have to think about not covering up the previous layer of ink. So you're, you're carving, you're inking, you're printing, and then I ended up with nine of these, um, which is pretty good. Uh, you usually lose a few because you don't register them right. And um, the last color I printed was black. And I, I actually do have the plate left, what's left of it. Um, you can't really do much with it at that point. But um, I don't know what else to say about this. Um, I don't no, no, that was, I mean, I liked hearing how the changes were very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. 
I think there was a cat involved originally too. I don't, I don't remember. It was a thought, but um, where I live, there's a lot of uh, shooting stars a lot and I'm able to see the sky better than I used to. And um, I love looking at the sky. So um, that's really what prompted this. But again, it's the process is what really interests me a lot about um, printing this way. Like she said, you can look on her blog and she, she talks about how to do a reduction um, print and she uses um, the changes in this one to show how, how or I can't remember, maybe it's a failed print. I, yeah, yeah, it is. Of, the failed, yeah, the failed print. And the failed print. <laughs> and this one truly is a lot better. Um, the other one was okay, but this one really did get much more focused. And um, so it's nice that you share, um, you know, your processes. So could you tell us about the um, Zoom that's coming up next week? Um, at this time, one to three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so next week we're going to do, um, it's really not a, a workshop and, it, and it's, it's a talk slash demonstration. Mm -hmm. And um, poor Bob Lee got um, <laughs> hijacked into helping me with um, the uh, visuals on this. So um, what we're going to be doing is uh, showing a lot of still photos and a couple short videos and I'll be talking over them about basically how to print with things that are just around your house. Um, so we won't be talking about something like this because this requires, you know, inks and brayers and, mm -hmm. and all that. But we'll be talking with things that you can print um, with things around your house and come up with some pretty nice looking things. Um, so that's what we'll be doing next week. If anybody wants to join us, um, we'll be here. Um, you can, if you go on um, the Plastic Club website and just keep scrolling down, you'll be able to um, find further information of how to um, join this um, Zoom salon. So it sounds very fun, very interesting, especially in this time where, you know, People may not have access to printing presses, to supplies. Um, it definitely, we thank you very much for sharing um, your insights into these kinds of processes with us. So I am finished with my part um, of the show. And if people have questions um, that you wanna ask other people, um, if you have anything else you wanna share, um, speak up. <laughs> yeah, I do, Roberta. First, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so Roberta, thank you. You're so articulate and you're offering so many personal insights that help illuminate the work for the rest of us. And I oh, love that you. we get to hear directly from the artist because this is something that we don't normally get to enjoy when we're at an in-person exhibition. So although the online exhi exhibitions have their limitations, they also have their benefits. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing out the best of the benefits. So I really thank you for that. Oh, I want to say a special welcome to all of the people among you who are not Plastic Club members. Somebody asked earlier today um, about that. Uh, and um, so I just want to give you a very short idea of who we are. The question is, who are you, the, the Plastic Club? Plastic Club was founded in 1897 by the professional women of Philadelphia who were not admitted to the men's sketch club. So they formed their own, their own home, their own place where they could network with one another. They could draw the figure, they could socialize um, and so on. It was a pro professional association. And um, the home of the Plastic Club is on Kamak Street um, downtown. And we've been there since 1909. We've had some very illustrious members in our history and you can find all this at the Plastic Club website. So the foundation of what we do is we have uh, life drawing workshops um, during normal times. Right now that's suspended. We also have monthly exhibitions, which you're enjoying today. This is our different form for the time being. Um, we have musical events, we have movie events, we have salons. We have anything that um, the members want to um, put together. Um, there's a very strong tradition of volunteerism at the club. We have a strong board and a strong team of volunteers. So um, membership is um, an option to all of you. You can see the membership 
information online. Um, you can enjoy the benefits of the club without membership. I want to say that because I think membership is a great thing. It, it, it affirms your identity as an artist um, and, and it kind of helps to connect you strongly with the club, but everybody is welcome. So um, anyway, that's it. Thank you. Glad, glad you reminded people. Um, again, I do want to thank um, Tina, Bob Lee, and Laura Stark. Um, during the time when we don't do things in walls, we can't go in the building, the Plastic Club has been extraordinarily active. And it's active because we have those talented, talented volunteers who have been giving unstintedly of their time. Um, you know, I used to give time putting art on the walls. Can't do that. <laughs> so thank goodness for um, these people who are really keeping the Plastic Club reaching out to the public and reaching out to its members um, and um, making it a time that actually is meaningful. So thank you again to those behind the scene doers. <laughs> so I, I don't have anything else to say. I don't know if anybody else does. Keep watching the website. Things just pop up. It's amazing how much goes on now. <laughs>